Um, McGee, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? So McGee is going to talk to us about primary ciliary dyskinesia. Um, she has really been a, one of the leaders in this field since uh, its inception and has authored, uh, uh, been an author, either if not the lead author, uh, senior author, but authored most of the guidelines on uh, the care of these patients. So McGee, I'm going to stop talking now and mute myself and it's all yours. Well, thanks a, thanks a lot, Jim, and I enjoy giving this lecture each year to the fellows. It's much more fun when I can see you, um, but that's not the way it is this year. But at any rate, I'll uh, give you an overview, and hopefully I'll get to see you at an ATS meeting in the future. Uh, let's see. Me too. Got everything but how to do my next slide. Okay, so these are my uh, financial disclosures, uh, just uh, research grants related to PCD from uh, different uh, pharma. And what I'm gonna talk to you about to start off with is talk about primary ciliary dyskinesia is a rare disease. You just heard about pulmonary hypertension in pediatrics. That's a rare disease. A lot of what we take care of in pediatric pulmonology are rare diseases. And so what's the definition of a rare disease? Well, the NIH describes a rare or defines a rare disease as one is a disorder that affects less than 200,000 people in the United States. And using that definition, there are about 7,000 rare diseases that affect 20, 25 to 30 million people in the US. And this is rare diseases of all, all different organs, not just the lung. So what are rare lung diseases? We have uh, cystic fibrosis, which uh, most of you are very familiar with. That's a rare disease, affects about 35,000 people in the US. Uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia, is uh, less common and affects about 17,000. That's a real rough estimate. Uh, for cystic fibrosis from the registry, we're pretty confident of the numbers. Uh, for PCD, this is a real rough estimate because we don't have a registry yet. Um, childhood interstitial lung diseases, if you combine them all together, it's about 10,000. If you take some of those uh, surfactant disorders you just uh, heard about, um, those are like one in a million. So they're, they're super rare even compared to uh, uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia. So what's a common disease? Asthma. Asthma affects 22 million people in the United States. So that's like uh, all rare diseases together is what we see with asthma. So when you go to ATS meetings and you see lots and lots and lots of sessions on asthma and only one on primary ciliary dyskinesia or, or combined with uh, interstitial lung disease, this is why 22 million people have asthma. All right, so we'll talk about primary ciliary dyskinesia now, I'll give you a timeline. Uh, most of you know about card, cardigan or uh, triad or cardigan or syndrome. Uh, I say cardigan or some of you may say cardigan or, but uh, Dr. Cardigan or pronounced his name cardigan or, so that's why I'm saying it this way. Uh, but uh, 1933, uh, Dr. Cartagena described the triad of situs inversus, chronic sinusitis, and bronchiectasis. And so uh, he's, uh, was, that name was given for Cartagena syndrome. If you go back in the literature, that triad was described, actually first described that anybody's found so far in 1904 by a person named Seward. Uh, so it really wasn't the first description in 1933, but that's where most people describe the start of, of uh, understanding ciliary disease. 
then in 1976, um, uh, Alf Celius looked at patients who had cardigan or triad and found, uh, and, and at that time, electron microscopy was available. And he looked at the cilia in patients with cardigan or triad and found that they were missing dynein arms. And he looked at those cilia under the light microscope and, and in those patients, the cilia did not move. And so he coined the term emotile cilia syndrome for the patients. He also found that uh, siblings of patients with cardigan or triad who had normal orientation of their organs had uh, but had chronic sinusitis and bronchiectasis had the same ciliary defect. And he was the first to, uh, Alf Celius was the first to postulate that uh, patients with, with this disorder of cilia had a random uh, chance of having normal placement of their organs or situs inversus. So then, so that's 1976, we got electron microscopy and defining the syndrome. And then over the next five years, there actually were a lot of studies uh, trying to characterize the disorder. Um, and, uh, and at that, and in 1981, people found that in some cases the cilia moved, they just didn't move in a coordinated fashion. And that's when the term primary ciliary dyskinesia came in. They knew it was a genetic disorder. It appeared usually it was autosomal recessive. Um, and so there, that's where the primary came from. And then as opposed to secondary defects like you get after viral infections or exposure to pollutants. So primary ciliary dyskinesia that's not moving normally, but it uh, in a lot of cases was moving some, so could no longer call it a motile cilia syndrome. And studies of people with primary ciliary dyskinesia, uh, particularly children, showed that they had chronic ear, sinus, and lung disease. Uh, about 50% had situs inversus totalis. Uh, adult males had uh, infertility attributed to defective sperm motility because the sperm tail mimics what's going on in the cilium. And there was usually autosomal recessive. Okay, so that takes us up to about 1994, where uh, uh, there were a couple of crazy Swedes who for some reason measured nasal nitric oxide in patients with primary ciliary dyskinesia. And I still don't know why they even did this, but they did in 1994 and they found that uh, nitric oxide was low in people who had primary ciliary dyskinesia, much, much lower than in healthy patients. Um, and uh, I'll talk about this later, but that's now one of the tests that we do for primary ciliary dyskinesia. And then we get to 1999, that's when the first gene was de de detected. One of the dynein genes was uh, uh, mutated in a patient with uh, PCD, the first description of that. And then in the um, early uh, 2000s, some, uh, uh, and, and later 2000s, some of the more recent observations was that people who had primary ciliary dyskinesia, about 85% have neonatal respiratory distress. Um, this is uh, not the disorder that it's not um, just have needing a little oxygen in the delivery room or transient tachypnea. This is having requiring oxygen for greater than uh, 24 hours. In some cases, can be uh, uh, weeks uh, of needing oxygen um, in the newborn period. Often uh, misdiagnosed as neonatal pneumonia or uh, uh, transient tachypnea of the newborn. 
Um, and then another uh, feature was found is not everybody has either sight, the normal orientation of organs or situs inverses, but some have something in between situs ambiguous or heterotaxy, and that occurs in about 10% of patients with PCD, and some of those can have complex congenital heart disease. And if you come up to this year, we have now over uh, 40 genes. Um, actually, when I prepared this talk uh, for thinking I was giving it in May, I said over 40 genes, but uh, there are three genes about to be published. And when that happens, we will be at 50 uh, different genes that may be mutated in PCD. So that's the brief time, brief overview timeline, and we will go on to our first audience response question. And actually, I hope somebody's on the call who can help me with this um, to make sure I can get your responses. But you are counseling parents whose child has just been diagnosed with primary ciliary dyskinesia. And they ask, what is the typical mode of inheritance for PCD? Autosomal dominant, X-linked, autosomal recessive, polygenic mutations in multiple different genes, or chromosomal disorder. And somebody should be running that, or do I need to go to the next slide? Uh, I think Liz is sending a chat and saying that it, uh, the it wasn't added. Um, oh, it wasn't added in time? Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so just go ahead and uh, okay. review the, uh, res the response. Okay. So the correct answer is autosomal recessive. In the most of the cases, the typical mode is autosomal recessive. But it, some of the genes that have recently been identified are X-linked. And then last year, there was a gene that's, that was identified that is autosomal dominant. So I would say well over 90% of the cases are autosomal recessive, but there can be uh, genes that are either X-linked or autosomal dominant. All right, so give you a little rundown on mucociliary clearance and cough clearance. As you know, cilia line the surface of uh, at the epithelium. And so at the apex of the cells is cilia. They ha there's a periciliary fluid layer um, that the cilia beat in. And then at the surface is uh, mucus that can occur in a mucus layer or mucus rafts. And in the uh, blue figure below shows uh, on the left normal cilia that are beating, um, have plenty of fluid so that the cilia can beat and move the mucus um, that lies over top of them. So they have normal mucus clearance and normal cough clearance. That's what CC is there. Uh, in cystic fibrosis, uh, there's dehydration of the fluid layer. And so the cilia cannot beat as well. And the secretions are dehydrated uh, the mucus secretions are dehydrated and sticky, so they are not cleared as well with cough. So you have both impaired mucociliary clearance and impaired cough clearance. In PCD, the defect is that the cilia don't move uh, appropriately to move the mucus. So the mucus sits there. And there is periciliary fluid layer there the mucus is on top of that fluid layer, and they can cough and clear that mucus. And in fact, there's some evidence that their cough clearance, at least in young children, is, um, is enhanced um, because the mucus it sits there, but then when they cough, they can get more mucus cleared out. So that's shown better on the right panel uh, this is showing clearance of radioisotopes. So if you have a subject uh, inhale uh, labeled particles, radio labeled particles, and then sit in front of a gamma counter, 
you can measure the clearance of particles. Now this takes a bit more calculation than what I'm saying here because they've got to account for this three-dimensional removal of things. However, um, if you uh, do these analyses, on the, as you can see on the bottom uh, line with the circles is a normal individual sits in front of the gamma counter, doesn't move around, is just sitting quietly, and with mucociliary clearance is clearing radio-labeled isotope uh, that they inhaled um, over two hours. And you can see about 40% of what they inhaled is, is um, removed by mucociliary clearance. The next line up is cystic fibrosis. And so by sitting in front of the gamma counter, they still have some clearance with mucociliary clearance, but not, it's about half of what you saw in the normal individual. And then the top line is PCD. And if an individual with PCD sits quietly, the mucus that they're normally making is not cleared it's not until they cough that it's cleared. So for the first hour and a half, this person was sitting uh, quietly in front of the gamma counter, nothing moved, and then they took 15 coughs and came down, and then another 15 coughs and another 15 coughs. And you can see that just by coughing, they cleared as much as the patient with CF did sitting for two hours with mucociliary clearance. So I, this uh, should help you understand that cough is good in PCD. And this is what I preach to all of my parents. Cough is good. Do not inhibit cough in PCD. All right, so in uh, 2004, we uh, did uh, reviewed the patients that we had evaluated here at UNC. Uh, we had, at that time, 31 pediatric patients, 47 adult patients, and looking at uh, clinical features. And they all had chronic cough. They all had chronic rhinitis, sinusitis. Uh, almost all had chronic otitis. And uh, at that point, there had been some case reports of neonatal respiratory distress, but not systematically querying for that. And we asked all of these individuals if there was a history of neonatal respiratory distress. 87% of the pediatric patients had that history, 65% of the adults. We think there may be some differences here due to who provided the history. For the pediatric patients, the parents provided the history who would know whether there was neonatal respiratory distress. For the adults, the adult patient provided the history who may not know whether or not they had neonatal respiratory distress. So um, we think that number may be attributed to some differences in who, who provided the history. Bronchiectasis we saw in 61% of the pediatric patients, 98% of the adults. Um, as uh, you know, the bronchiectasis develops over time. Some of these patients were as young as eight months of age. So I think the number is lower in the pediatric patients because they had not yet developed bronchiectasis. And then for situs and versus, we saw 68% uh, of the pediatric patients and 46% of the adults. And I think that may be some bias in diagnosis, in, in, at least in the 1990s, 2000s, that the pediatric patients came to attention if they had situs and versus and may not come to attention as early if they did not have situs and versus. But we wanted to define uh, the features better to get a better understanding of what type of chronic cough or what type of features would uh, be, uh, would, would make people more sus suspicious of PCD. So, we developed, 
develop the Genetic Dis Disorders of Mucociliary Con Clearance Consortium in 2004, about the time that paper came out. And I tell you about this because it shows you with a rare disease, the way you can get to uh, study a rare disease is develop a network of centers um, and uh, have a uh, systematic approach to studying this, the disorder. So this consortium started in 2004 and our first specific aims were to develop a clinical research network to study rare disease of the airways focused on PCD to test for disease-causing mutations in PCD to develop a genetic diagnostic approach, and to perform a longitudinal study in infants and children to define the clinical pathogenesis of airways disease by serially tracking uh, their clinical history, respiratory cultures, pulmonary function tests, and chest CTs. So this shows a list of all the sites um, on the right-hand side that were involved in the consortium. And the dots are individuals across the country who came to one of our sites. So those in uh, Carolina blue came to UNC and those in uh, bright blue went to St. Louis, et cetera, across. So you can see we covered almost all of the uh, U.S., a lot of Canada, and even some countries in Central America and uh, one patient from Egypt uh, coming to participate in our studies. So to define uh, clinical features, we had a list of questions that we asked and so we could define things. So for neonatal respiratory distress, we asked whether they had the distress, but then we asked if they were term or not, and if they were, uh, and whether or not they required supplemental oxygen for greater than a day, and whether or not they had meconium aspiration. So we eliminated those that have, by making sure that they were term, we eliminated babies who might have neonatal respiratory distress due to prematurity, requiring supplemental oxygen for greater than a day eliminated some of the transient tachypneas, and uh, meconium aspiration, uh, we eliminated those that might, uh, we eliminated those so that by asking that series of questions, that's how we define unexplained neonatal respiratory distress. Similarly, with cough, we asked whether it was year-round, wet, and if it went the age of onset, we defined, began before or at six months of age as our series of questions to define early onset, year-round, wet cough. Chronic nasal congestion is, again, uh, year-round and began at or before six months of age. And situs and versus totalis, we had yes, and then any other laterality defects. So this added some other defects with heterotaxy um, to that question. We had similar questions with otitis to try to define uh, the type of otitis that would go along with PCD, but could not um, make that more sp specific. So at any rate, we asked all these questions for people who came in. We had 205 uh, patients with confirmed PCD and compared that with 187 who we felt had some other disorder um, after evaluating them. And you can see from um, the p-value that we had um, the four uh, that I just showed you all the questions we showed uh, had significant difference from the PCD versus the other diseases that they that were referred to us and but with multiple ear infections we just couldn't make anything uh, and I think it's because ear infections are just so common in pediatrics it's hard to tease that out that uh, that was different in PCD so if you had of those uh, on the bottom part here, the bottom of the table is showing 
um, the number of criteria define clinical features. So if they had all four of those features, meaning neonatal respiratory distress, situs and versus, chronic wet cough, chronic nasal congestion, you would pick up, maybe that would be 21% of PCD, but your specificity is 0.99. Um, and so even if you had two of those, your sensitivity is 0.8 and specificity is 0.72, so it's pretty good. So two or more, you can be uh, fairly confident they have PCD. And if they have one, it's still suspicious that they could have PCD. So just looking at that on the ROC curve, it, it's a pretty good, just using those clinical criteria is a pretty good diagnostic test um, for a PCD. So we define those uh, clinical features. So based on what I just told you, which of the following patients is most likely to have primary ciliary dyskinesia? And these are all patients that were referred to me. He, uh, eight year old with situs and versus totalis, but no chronic respiratory symptoms. A 17 year old girl who developed chronic cough at 15 years of age and now has bronchiectasis on chest CT. A three year old child with year round wet cough, year round nasal congestion and a history of neonatal respiratory distress despite term gestation or a 14 year old with history of chronic intermittent asthma and allergic rhinitis with a recent sinus T CT showing mucosal thickening of the right maxillary sinus. And the answer is a three year old with just the wet cough and wet nasal congestion and a history of neonatal respiratory distress. So, Many people would think the situs and versus totalis, but the lack of any chronic respiratory symptoms um, made that much less likely. The 17-year-old who didn't have cough until 15 years of age, that would be, you know, most, most patients with PCD have chronic cough like in the, in, the, in the neonatal period. In the NICU, the nurses will say they have a wet cough. Uh, so uh, to, to not appear until 15 years of age would be unusual for PCD. And then the sinusitis in just one situs, usually in uh, PCD you have pan sinusitis similar to what you see in CF. Okay. So what is the best way to diagnose PCD? And there's no single test. Um, I think any of any, there, lots of us argue about which is the best test, <laughs> but the real bottom line is you need a panel of tests to put together to make sure that everything fits. Um, and that panel of tests includes uh, clinical criteria that we just discussed, uh, nasal nitric oxide measurement, a ciliary biopsy for electron microscopy and genetic testing for mutations uh, in, in PCD genes. Um, and those are kind of the four tests that we use at the PCD centers around uh, North America. Other testing that can be used by people who are, who are uh, experts in this are uh, ciliary biopsy with high-speed video microscopy. This is used a lot in some of the European centers um, where they feel very comfortable uh, assessing video microscopy. It's a hard thing to uh, standardize and use um, across different centers. Uh, the emerging uh, study is immunofluorescent analyses of ciliary biopsy, so it's light microscopy. Most pathologists now are very um, adept at immunofluorescent analysis, and I think this is where things may be going uh, and will be replacing ciliary biopsy for electron microscopy in the future. And then there are a few places that use mucociliary clearance studies. I'm reluctant to do that just because of the radioactivity, but 
um, that's another study that could be done. Nasal nitric oxide um, is measured by um, uh, placing a catheter in the nostril with a small amount of suction. The gas is aspirated from the nose into an analyzer. And we have the patient blow into, this is a little cardboard tube with a pinhole in the end but by blowing into that, they close their palate. So you're only aspirating gas from the nose and the sinuses um, and while they're blowing against the resistor. And so this will show you, here's a healthy control next to a PCD. Not only is the the healthy control much higher than the PCD, but then if you look at the scale, the healthy control is 800 and the PCD scale is up to 80. So it's a, a tenth to um, a fiftieth of the value of healthy control. So it's much, much lower. Um, and we'll, the next slide shows a study that we did looking at uh, lots of uh, patients, uh, 103 who had longitudinal data, 182 PCD patients versus 78 controls that we used to uh, establish the, the cutoff uh, values of 77 nanoliters per minute. And uh, that worked fairly well. We set this so that it was 98% uh, uh, or 90 uh, sensitivity of 0.98 um, by design. Uh, but then a new gene was described uh, right shortly after we published this, that uh, RSPH1, who often some of those patients had values that were lower than our cutoff. So it showed that uh, we're higher than our cutoff. Some of these PCD patients were higher than our cutoff. And so it showed that um, it, we aren't as good as we initially thought we were uh, with the, relying on NO, and that's part of why you need multiple different tests. Okay, so how do you get a ciliary biopsy? Uh, some of you may have been doing ciliary biopsies at the time of bronchoscopy, which is one way to do it, but you can do this in the clinic. Um, by scraping the inferior surface of the nasal turban, turbinate. You can use a brush. I prefer to use what's shown on this slide, which is a rhino probe. It's a small uh, plastic probe that has a tiny spoon on the end. And we uh, will place that probe uh, through a surgical uh, otoscope and scrape along the inferior surface of the inferior turbinate. And when I say scrape, it's really all you're trying to do is get the surface cells. You don't have to do a deep scrape. If you do this correctly, you shouldn't even have bleeding, although some kids will move and you might get a little bit of a nosebleed afterwards. But you're just uh, rubbing the end of the probe across the surface of the inferior turbinate to loosen up the, sur the, the single surface cells there that have the cilia. And you, immediate place, you immediately place that sample in culture media if you're looking for high-speed microsco video microscopy, or you place it immediately in fixative if you're going for electron microscopy. And these are the sorts of things you see on electron microscopy, uh, as you may remember from your uh, cell biology classes, the uh, cilium has uh, nine plus two orientations. So there are nine doublets around the central pair and off of each of the doublets are the uh, uh, outer and inner dining arms. Uh, shown in the diagram in green here, or in this normal individual, you can see the gray, uh, dark gray um, 
outer and inner dining arms. The outer dining arm makes a little hook and the inner dining arm is, is straight. The uh, second cross section shows missing outer dining arms. And to me, these are the easiest to recognize looking at uh, uh, cross sections where you can see the inner dining arm, but there's no outer dining arm to go with it. So you know you've got the right contrast when you can see that inner dining arm and there's just clear space where the outer dining arm should be. Uh, the next cross section shows both uh, inner and outer dining arms are absent. Um, I always worry that maybe there's poor uh, uh, contrast or fixation that maybe that's the reason why when I'm missing both. Um, and like to look at lots of cross sections to make sure that, um, that that's um, not just on, uh, a poor uh, contrast slide. Um, and then the next is uh, absence of the inner dining arm with microtubular disorganization. Uh, this is actually a relatively recent uh, description of this abnormality, but is uh, uh, clearly seen with a specific genetic defect that I'll talk about later. And then absence of the inner dining arm alone. Um, can occur as an acquired defect, and it's more likely to occur as a, an acquired defect. There has been uh, one, um, one gene that was recently described that's associated with absence of inner dining arm alone, but most of the time we think it's an acquired defect, so uh, we'll be hesitant to call that PCD unless it's seen on repeated biopsies. But these are the uh, three hallmark, absent outer dining arm, absent of both dining arms, or absent inner dining arm with microtubular disorganization. These are like the hallmark defects. You can also get changes in the central apparatus, with, particularly with radial spoke gene defects. Um, but uh, even though you can see some of these things like the central pair is missing or the central pair is off center or there's a transposition of one of the uh, doublets into the center, 90% um, uh, of the time the, uh, the, the uh, cross section looks normal. And so this is one of the near normals, uh, normal or near normal EMs that we will see, we'll just say it's suspicious for maybe a radial spoke problem, but we're not sure. With high-speed video microscopy, there's certain uh, ciliary patterns that people look for. The first uh, square shows a normal movement. The cilium beats in a plane, so it's a forward, back, all in one plane um, with a, uh, uh, the backstroke is coming with the cilium uh, bent, and then it extends for the, the forward stroke. Um, the next, oh, to the right of that is uh, virtually immotile, and if you have missing of both the outer and inner dining arms, um, the cilium can be a motile, it just stands stiff with no motility at all. At the bottom left is a cilium that has an outer dining arm defect. It's stiff, it doesn't have the full movement with the bend, um, and the ciliary uh, beat frequency is decreased. And then the central pair defects, this is interesting, the cilium moves in a circular motion instead of in a plane. So they're actually very motile, but um, they move in a circular motion, so there's not effective mucociliary clearance. All right, so let's get to genes. So you got multiple genes, as I talked about, with multiple different mutations within those genes that can alter proteins, that can alter the structure function that can cause disease. 
So it's really complex. This is not like sickle cell where you have one defect in one, pro one mutation causing one defect in a protein, one structural change for that disease. So this is 43 of the, what will soon be 50 different genes. And I've list them, show them in order of how many exons they have. So exons are the coding regions in the genes. And when cystic fibrosis, when we found that gene uh, in 1989, we thought this was uh, a huge gene with 27 exons that's shown in pink at the end is CFTR. And this shows that some of the genes for, C for uh, PCD are two to three times larger than CFTR. So if you add up all these genes, it's, it's close to, and probably now with the new genes is, is over a thousand coding exons <clears throat> that uh, looking at genetic analysis is huge area to, to cover. So if we break down the genes by what kind of defect, this will show you that there are multiple genes that can cause outer, di outer dining arm. There are multiple genes that cause outer plus inner dining arm. There are two genes so far that we know that cause uh, inner dining arm with uh, microtubular disorganization. Then, uh, as I told you before, there's one recent one found with IDA. Then oligocilia means uh, that they don't make many cilia uh, in the cells. And so there are three genes that have been associated with that. Um, and then the normal, near normal, there are multiple genes that can cause uh, that as well. So lots of things to screen for. There's one gene, this NEK10, that's at the bottom of the normal, near normal list, uh, was a gene that was presented last ATS by a adult pulmonary fellow. And uh, we all met with him afterwards, and sure enough, this is a gene that caused uh, cilia to be shortened. So there's, you, there's things you can do. If you're interested in genetics, there's lots you can do with PCD. Um, and then there are two uh, syndromes that are associated with PCD that have defects in actually the, the sensory cilia. One is retinitis pigmentosa. There are patients that have been, uh, have retinitis pigmentosa and have associated uh, PCD. One of the patients in our longitudinal study indeed had, we diagnosed PCD but did not know the defect and later uh, he had manifestations of retinitis pigmentosa. And then orofacial digital syndrome is also a uh, sensory ciliel defect that, that can. So there's some uh, this evidence that you can have a defect in, that affects both sensory and motor cilia. All right, so for diagnostic approach, Look at clinical features, if they have the clinical features, if you, and you have the ability to do nasal NO, I would go to nasal NO next, and then after nasal NO would get genetics, and then after that, uh, transmission electron microscopy, if you still aren't, aren't uh, confident at the diagnosis. If you don't have access to nasal NO, after you've got clinical, if you've got clinical features, I'd go on to genetics. And then if you don't get an answer from genetics, go to, to EM. About 70% of PCD can be explained by genetics and about 70% can be explained by EM. It's just easier to get blood than it is to get a scrape. Um, of good quality and, and get a good EM. All right, so what's the natural history of the lung disease during childhood? We didn't know a whole lot till 
some of our longitudinal studies. Um, this uh, study, we had uh, 137 uh, patients with confirmed PCD in our longitudinal study um, who were less than 18 at the time of enrollment. We saw them yearly, got respiratory cultures at each visit. And um, if you look at uh, over the age ranges, we showed this in the same age ranges that most of you are used to looking at data for cystic fibrosis. Um, the most uh, prevalent organism is Haemophilus influenza. Then next down is staph. Next down is strep pneumoniae. Uh, and those of you who've seen patients with CF, I bet you've never seen a culture with strep pneumoniae. It's rare in that population, but uh, common in PCB. Then next down is more axilla cataralogist. And then the green is pseudomonas. So you have to, it's not very common. It stays low during childhood and just starts to go up as you get uh, 15 to 17, and then this would be 18 to 20 in that range. So uh, just in, in the late childhood, early adulthood is when we're starting to see pseudomonas. It becomes more, more prevalent in adulthood. Uh, what, how does lung function change over age? This was a study from Denmark um, that looked at uh, children and adults over time and showed their linear regression uh, of, of their lung function over time from their first measured lung function. And if you look at this, some, most go down, some go up. Um, and, uh, you know, some go down a lot, some stay the same. So it's not a consistent pattern um, for uh, patients. So we were interested in seeing what uh, did in childhood. Our first study looked at cross-sectional analysis. And um, if we looked at those with the outer uh, dining arm defects, or outer plus inner dining arm defects, they had uh, their lung function really didn't change over time from four to 18 years of age. But the group with the microtubular, dis the inner dining arm with microtubular disorganization declined, there was a uh, decline over age. This is cross sectional, so there was an age associated decline um, with this group. So we then looked at our longitudinal data and those with outer dining arm did not change much over, over time, but the inner dining arm with central apparatus and microtubular disorganization, there was, uh, did uh, have a more uh, steep decline than all the others uh, combined. For the whole group, the uh, decline was 0.57% uh, per year. So um, if we look at all those genes, the CCDC39, CCDC40 have uh, worse lung disease. I didn't show you data on this, but that RSPH1 has milder lung disease. That was the one that had uh, better, uh, had uh, higher nasal nitric oxide values as well. All right, so a lot still to learn about uh, lung function and progression of disease. So something that we have learned a little bit about recently is the role of cilia in directing orientation of organs. Uh, Cytosine versus totalis is a, a, a random in PCD. This shows two identical twin sisters. Uh, uh, one had cytos solidus, the other had cytos versus totalis. Um, they were monozygotic twins proven genetically. And so this supports the hypothesis that um, 
Alcelius made many years ago that uh, situs and versus was a random event in PCD. You were taking away whatever directs laterality, so you have a 50-50 chance of having uh, situs and versus totalis. So what is it that you're taking away? Well, in 2006, uh, in some very elaborate work by these investigators from Japan, they looked at the embryos of mice. And I'm going to take you back to early embryology when you have a ball of cells that has an indentation that's the foregut. This is a stage of gastrulation. The FG, the foregut is going to be the intestines. And here's the neural, NP is the neural plate that will be the nervous system. And right below the neural plate is the ventral node. So in the, the panel A to the right of the first pan, panel A is, uh, shows a higher power of that ventral node. And each cell has a single cilium on it in the ventral node. And that cilium is very similar to the cilia that I just showed you um, from the respiratory epithelium except it is missing the central pair. So it has uh, dub nine doublets and it has dynine arms, but there's no central pair. And these cilia move in a circular motion, shown here. Um, so they move in a circular motion. So how does that cause direction, directional flow? Well, they come off the the cell at, that's rounded, so they come off at an angle, and so one side of the circular movement comes back against the next cell, and the other is up free-floating, so you have a net flow of fluid. So across that ventral node, there's a net flow of fluid from left to right, and takes uh, signals along that way, and that is what directs laterality. And that's an area that's still being studied is what are the important signals in that early stage of embryonic development. But that's where uh, uh, cilia that don't work end up with um, losing the ability to distinguish left and right. So what about congenital heart disease and heterotaxy and PCD? Between 1982 and 2005, there were three case reports with heterotaxy um, that I referenced down at the bottom. And then in 2007, we looked at, had, with uh, four other centers, looked uh, at um, the uh, distribution of uh, patients' uh, uh, laterality defects. And that meant reviewing their x-rays and CT scans uh, to get a better handle for any evidence of laterality defect. And so that was a total of 337 patients, 46% had situs solidus, and 47.7% had situs inversus totalis. But 6% of that group had heterotaxy. And this was before anybody really recognized that heterotaxy was involved. So they may not, some of these patients may not have uh, been detected uh, or had already diagnosed. So we're, there's some bias. We may have missed some of these. Um, but in looking at this, some had only vascular anomalies like duplication of the superior vena cava or interruption of the inferior vena cava. And some had complex congenital heart disease, heterotaxic heart disease. Um, so we get, and some had neither of those. They may have just had asplenia or polysplenia. So um, at any rate, uh, without started us to look more in a more recent study, the prevalence of heterotaxy is more like 12% and congenital heart disease is more like 
so this shows the multiple uh, uh, changes in the cardiovascular system that can occur with uh, heterotaxy. Um, some of these are, are really severe complex heart disease and some are really subtle defects. And then um, some of the non-cardiovascular. So you could have a, a bilobed, uh, two bilobed left lungs or two trilobed right lungs, which is always fun when you're doing bronchoscopy or just uh, isolated abdominal situs inversus or isolated thoracic situs inversus or intestinal malrotation. So the types of cilia that have um, uh, either, the, that are similar to the, uh, well, the types of cilia that are affected <laughs> that can cause a laterality defect are those with uh, uh, dining arms um, defects. If you had uh, CCNO, which gives oligocilia, you only have one cilium there, so that, that doesn't, uh, that's not a defect that would affect the embryonic cilia, nor will any of the central pair proteins because they're not mis they're, they are missing the central pair. So not all the, the genes are associated with laterality defect, just the ones that, that I've listed here. All right, so management of PCD. Uh, this is a rare disease. Uh, they're not really clinical trials to direct evidence-based management, although their trials, uh, two trials have been completed and we will have information on that. And management is based on the experience of the specialist um, uh, with chronic lung disease. So. Few centers handle uh, more than, a, than four or five patients with PCD. So uh, if you're depending on experience, you're biased by the few patients that, you're, that you follow. Um, but uh, places where we've seen more patients with PCD, we've been able to uh, develop uh, general principles and guidelines uh, the key principles are to enhance airway clearance. Um, and like I said earlier, cough clearance is good in PCD. You want these patients to cough. You do not want them to use cough suppressants. Uh, you want them to exercise because that will get them to cough. Um, you use uh, measures to prevent respiratory infections such as uh, uh, immunizations for influenza and pneumococcus um, and uh, uh, social distancing, <laughs> um, those sorts of things. Uh, monitor with respiratory cultures and respiratory functions, similar to what we do with CF. Um, treat respiratory infections appropriately and based on the cultures. Avoid exposure to airway irritants and uh, maintain a healthy lifestyle. So you're caring for a seven-year-old with PCD. This is your next uh, audience response question. You're caring for a seven-year-old with PCD and this child's parents inquire about specific therapies for PCD. So which of the following therapies has been tested in a randomized placebo-controlled trial in PCD patients and demonstrated to have clinical benefit? Recombinant DNAs, hypertonic saline, suppressive antibiotic therapy with azithromycin, or none of the above? And the answer, if I gave this in May, when I was supposed to, would be none of the above. But in May, the first published article came out, and now the answer is suppressive antibiotic therapy with azithromycin. Uh, the European uh, group uh, did a, a study. Uh, it was un they hoped to get 120 patients. They they only got 96, but they were still able to show that after six months of uh, cycling of azithromycin, three days a week, 
that they were able to decrease uh, pulmonary exacerbations in half. And so the correct answer now would be C. And there will, and hopefully with some of the networks that have developed around the world, we'll be able to get uh, more clinical trials going. So our, our priorities now for PCD clinical care and, and clinical research centers is to create a network. A PCD foundation has been uh, working to create this network and develop clinical practice guidelines, make accurate and early diagnosis of PCD with the clinical clues and access to diagnostic testing, um, create a centralized patient registry uh, at this point, we do not have a PCD registry like the CF registry, but that's our goal um, so that we, we can really define the true prevalence and incidence and track longitudinal data on a large number of patients. Um, access outcome measures for clinical, uh, assess outcome measures for clinical trials like lung function, chest CT, microbiology, quality of life tools and uh, perform those clinical trials. And so this shows some of the PCD centers around the country now. And uh, those, this is a great area for some of you as fellows, if you're interested to develop a niche, and take a, a PCD center to other places around the country. And with that, I will stop and uh, just show the large group that's been involved in this work. And uh, Mike Knowles here uh, with me. Uh, we've been working together for now going on 20 years on PCD. So we're both are older now than in that picture. So I'll take questions. I think I went a little bit long. Sorry, Jim. I'll take questions. I'll stay as long as anybody's got questions. Uh, no need to apologize, uh, uh, McGee. Uh, great talk as usual. And so um, please put your questions in the chat box. Um, so McGee, you, you know, you were, um, uh, you, you know, around in CF when um, it was in its infancy and now PCD, what are the similarities and the differences uh, between the, the two diseases as you see how things have progressed? Yeah, uh, when I first got started in this, people said that PCD was a mild CF. And I would say that's way off. Um, I think the, the young kids with PCD actually are sicker that from a respiratory standpoint are sicker than the young kids with CF. Even the young kids when I came along, that they tended to have more malnutrition back in, in the 80s, um, but not the bad ear, sinus, uh, lung problems that we see in young kids with uh, PCD. So I think Early PCD is worse than early CF, and then PCD gets stabilizes and is better, um, and then gets worse again in adulthood, and then is more comparable to CF. Great. I know there's a question. Uh, do we have a sense of average life expectancy of someone with PCD? We don't because we don't have a registry. I can tell you the oldest patient that we diagnosed in our consortium uh, was uh, 65 years old. Uh, there are a lot of PCD out there that don't know that they have PCD. Uh, Petter Noon, one of my colleagues gave a grand rounds and a physician came up, a 45 year old physician came up to him at the end of his grand rounds and said, I think I have PCD. Now we all know this happened in medical school. We all had, but sure enough, this 45 year old physician had PCD that was undiagnosed. So um, I think uh, people live in, live, well into adulthood with PCD, but there are also reports of 
lung transplants in um, in the 40s as well. So, yeah. Uh, next question is, uh, I apologize if I missed this, but what percentage of patients with situs and versus totalis have PCD? That's a good question. We, I, the estimate that everyone uses is a one in four to one in five people with, uh, one out of four, one out of five people with situs and versus have PCD but nobody has systematically studied that. Great. Uh, was the azithromycin study in adults only, do you postulate that this will be translated as a pediatric treatment? Yeah. <laughs> um, it hasn't made it to the guidelines yet. Um, I know that um, Many of my colleagues are using, and including myself, are using azithromycin for the people who have frequent exacerbations. Um, but if they're not having frequent exacerbations, we're not using it systematically. So I think it's still yet to be determined. It's something to consider. Um, and I think now we have some evidence that it is beneficial, but we still need to know more about this. That study was only done, was done in adults, not in children. Uh, so it'd be nice to have a study in children. So one of the things I'd like to um, comment on before I read the next question is, is, is a comment that you made in, in that, uh, you know, a lot of what we do in PCD, we borrow from what we learned in CF, which means that there's a lot of research that can be done out there in PCD. And if someone is looking to build a research career, I think the opportunities in PCD are enormous because, right, it's kind of where CF was. And then there was a lot of research done because of the CF Foundation. Now there's the PCD Foundation. And so, There'll be a ton of opportunities for uh, people who, who want to build a career and really kind of get in on the ground level. So just putting the plug in for that. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, in terms of clinical resources, have you found it better to have a PCD clinic structure alone or do you combine uh, with rare pulmonary disease type clinics? Um, it seems nationally people have gone either direction. Um, yeah, I think a, a lot of it just depends on how you're, how you structure things. Um, we, we had for a long time had PCD by itself. Most of the visits came in as research visits, not as clinical visits. Um, and then, um, so it was all, all done through that instead through a study coordinator more than through a nurse. Um, then we had a period without uh, funding and we went to the clinic and it was just easier to have that done with uh, rare diseases. Um, because when you're evaluating people for PCD or for uh, child or other rare diseases, you, you need to get lots of records and things like that. You need a nurse to, to help uh, collate, collect and organize all that. So um, I think it really just depends on what you're doing and what your volume is. It makes sense to combine uh, rare diseases and there's, and usually the people who like doing this sort of thing and reviewing volumes of <laughs> medical records and stuff are, are the same people who are gonna be interested in other rare diseases. Yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, sorry if I missed this, but any uh, what is the cutoff for nasal nitric oxide in kids less than five years? <laughs> well, the problem in kids less than five years is that they have to do tidal breathing rather than cooperating with blowing against a resistor. So um, for those kids, the levels are even low. They're lower then um, the, the normals are even are lower by about uh, 
then you have to factor in that children have lower values than adults. So children under five, actually newborns have very low levels. You would never tell PCD from uh, healthy control infants because they're both very low and the, the normals increase with age. So actually it would have to be an age related cutoff but it's much lower. I'll just tell you it's much lower than 77. And uh, we're still trying to sort out where you put those cutoffs. Great. Um, any other questions from the audience? Again, great questions. Thank you for being engaged. It's always nice uh, to see such uh, astute questions. Um, if uh, you think of something, you can, I'm sure, uh, send McGee an email and she'll respond to you individually. Um, uh, McGee, again, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your schedule to, to give this talk. And once again, great as always. Um, and I appreciate and one, one thing, Jim, I would tell all these uh, fellows, and when you heard this in the last talk, is genetics is going to be what rules. Um, and we've seen this in CF where the, the different uh, mutations do differently. And I just think anybody going into the medical field now just needs to be an expert in genetics. And yeah. you may say you're a pulmonologist, but your side expertise is going to be genetics. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Oh, one other announcement I'd like to make is uh, Ken Olivier, who's on this slide, uh, is actually will be giving a talk on uh, non tuberculous mycobacteria. That'll be added on July 29th, and Liz will send an email to all the fellows. So, uh, we... And Sharon Dill, I think, too, right? She's on Sharon? this slide. Yeah, Sharon's talking on Wednesday. Um, she's talking on uh, rheumatology, uh, pulmonary manifestations of rheumatologic diseases. And so, yeah, so she's this Wednesday and then Ken will be on July 29th. So Liz will send you an email. Um, well, if there's no further questions. I, I think we'll one here. And again, thank you to all the fellows for joining and for asking questions. And thank you, McGee, for uh, another excellent talk. Much appreciated. Thanks. Rather see everybody in person. Yeah. Yep. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.